very much. Yeah. So thank you very much and welcome to this event on the World Hepatitis Day. So we have an event that is organized uh, by IPQRB, ANRS, INSERM and ALPA on raising awareness on wild hepatitis elimination. And this event is also under the patronage of uh, French research agency ANRS. Uh, hepatitis, wild hepatitis is still a big problem and uh, during this event today, we have some really interesting speakers and thank you for joining in and listening to the presentations today. So we will have two parts. The first part will be dedicated to the presentations. And on the second part, we will have some questions from the audience and, and we will ask our distinguished speakers to just answer the questions. So for the first welcome remarks, so I will chair this meeting together with um, Professor Fabian Zulim. So I will give uh, the floor for the welcoming remarks also to Professor Fabian. He's a professor of medicine at the Lyon University. He's the head of hepatology department, Hospice Civic uh, de Lyon, head of viral hepatitis team in INSERM at the Cancer Research Center of Lyon, France. It is an honor to have you here, Professor Zulim, and please, few welcome words to all the people who are listening and, and viewing the event today. Sure. So thank you, um, uh, Marco, for, uh, um, uh, for organizing this, um, uh, this meeting. And uh, um, so it's really important that we, we raise a, a awareness on, on viral hepatitis elimination. And uh, um, I would like to also thank the, uh, the French uh, Agency for Research uh, Against AIDS and Hepatitis and Emerging Infectious Disease now, so uh, NRS, uh, which is a, a strong supporter in, in, in France uh, of um, uh, research against hepatitis viruses. Um, ELPA is really important because you, you are at the heart of, uh, of the question, so uh, patients with, living with liver disease and uh, and viral hepatitis uh, is really our, our aim to address the question of curing uh, the, the infection, the disease, and, uh, and also try to um, improve uh, diagnosis and linkage to care. So these are uh, very important to, to us. So I think it's very important that we, we, we maintain the link between um, researchers, clinicians, and uh, and, and patients, because we uh, this is the only way we will we will succeed to um, uh, to to develop novel novel therapies that will will be uh, implemented in real in real practice. So uh, um, uh, and uh, and also I would like to thank in advance all, all, all the speakers uh, who, who really uh, um, uh, um, we dedicate some time for uh, and, uh, for for this meeting, but also uh, uh, dedicate a lot of time uh, on a daily basis on on, on patient management. So, uh, having said that, I think we can we can move on, and I, I will give you the floor, Marco, to to introduce the, the next speaker. So, thank thanks again, uh, and I hope I forgot no one uh, in the acknowledgments. Thank you very much, Professor Zulim. So we need to address that and we need to say that the link between clinicians and patients and also other stakeholders is stronger because of the researchers like Professor Zulim, Professor Matijic and all others that are working very hard in the field of viral hepatitis elimination, especially also the work of the speaker that we will have today, uh, Dr. Boulier. Uh, but without that, let's, let's have an overview of viral hepatitis elimination across uh, European Union. And that will be presented by the head of Unit of Viral Hepatitis Clinic of Infectious Diseases and Febrile Illnesses at the University of Medical Center, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Professor Maticic, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marco. So dear colleagues, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great honor and privilege uh, to be here with you today and to um, Okay, let's share it. Um, is it okay? Is it the full screen? Uh, it's uh, open presentation. It's not a full screen. Okay, let's do it like this. Okay. 
Okay, is it okay now? Yes, no. Yeah, okay, perfect. so thank you very much. Sorry for this. Uh, so it's really a great honor uh, and to be here. And I'd like to thank particularly Elpa and uh, its president, Marco, for inviting me to present you the viral hepatitis elimination across Europe. Uh, well, we all know that uh, in 2016, the WHO set uh, up quite ambitious strategy to eliminate viral hepatitis with very demanding interim goals uh, by the year 2020 and uh, quite ambitious goals to be achieved by the year 2030, uh, with the aim to save 7.1 million lives globally by the year 2030. And to achieve those goals, two age-dependent interventions are key here. First, prevention of neonatal and childhood infection by HBV vaccination. And secondly, prevention of cirrhosis and liver cancer in adults by appropriate diagnosis and treatment. But in reality, as we know, um, only a few high income European countries are projected to meet the WHO mortality tar target by the year 2030, and others are so far not expected to meet these targets within the next eight years. So according to the WHO Global Progress Report from last year, in Europe, 15 million of HCV infected um, have been no of HBV infected have been noted, and every year 19,000 new infections occur with the mortality of 43,000 deaths yearly. But having a closer look at particular EU countries, the recent ECDC monitoring report, as we see here, presents very, very limited data because only 13 out of 22 countries reported the number of HBV positives by the year 2020 only eight countries reported data on those who were ever diagnosed, and of them, only four countries achieved the WHO targets by 2020, and only three out of 22 countries reported data on linkage to care, and none of them, as you see here, achieved the WHO targets by 2020. However, compared to hepatitis C virus, by treatment in HBV, only a partial or rarely a functional cure can be achieved. And of course, a sterilizing cure has so far been impossible, which is most probably be discussed further on. Uh, and this uh, warrants the high importance of vaccination against hepatitis B. However, uh, so far only 11 out of 20, uh, so far only 11 out of 22 uh, countries have achieved the WHO targets of 95% vaccine coverage by the year 2020. Now proceeding to the to hepatitis C, according to the WHO Global Progress Report from last year, there are estimated 40 million of HCV infected with 300,000 new infections per year and 64,000 deaths yearly. And again, a closer look at the number of HCV infected in a cascade of care in particular EU countries is very limited. Only 13 out of 22 countries reported data on the number of HCV infected by 2020. Only seven countries reported data on HCV diagnosed persons, and of them, as you can see here, only four achieved the WHO targets by the year 2020. And finally, only nine out of 22 countries reported treatment data, and none of them achieved the target by 2020. So what's going on actually? The WHO Global Progress Report showed that by the year 2020, some major increase has globally been achieved in HIV treatment, which has already positively affected the mortality rates. However, as we know in Europe, only a quarter of HIV infected have so far been diagnosed and of them only a third have so far received treatment. And the problem is that those coverages needs to increase because the, the scale up of diagnosis and treatment has been really very, very slow. And the, the report has also shown that the core barrier in the progress of global health sector strategy is actually inequity. 
The poorest access to HIV testing and treatment services often have the most marginalized populations that actually face the highest rates of infection, such as people who inject drugs. And as for Europe, in this context, people who inject drugs definitely need to be focused primarily because they are the driving force of HIV epidemic. 60% of already infected and 80% of newly infected represent people who inject drugs. And among 2 million of HIV infected drug users, three quarters of infected come from the countries of Eastern Europe. The HIV center prevalence among people who inject drugs across Europe, according to the MCDDA report, has been varying tremendously from below 20 to up to even 90% in some Baltic countries. But we know that the WHO encourages its member states to organize public health response that would facilitate the rollout of care and treatment on a national scale by setting up a national strategy and action plan. And so far, 11 out of 22 countries reported having a national strategy or plan that is funded. And additional four countries reported uh, to have such plan with no funds allocated. So the current status of key indicators of progress in different countries shows that particularly in Western Europe, a substantial progress has been made toward elimination targets. And as you may see here, uh, there is a majority of Greens uh, when it comes to HBV and HIV publicly funded screening programs. There's also a vast majority of greens when it comes to HIV treatment reimbursement and less when it comes to reimbursement to treatment for HPV. And those treatments are still prescribed mostly by the specialists in the majority of countries. However, when it comes to coverage of harm reduction programs, very few countries can show satisfactory results. But the fact is that the combination of opiate agonist treatment and high coverage middle and syringe exchange programs can reduce HCV incidence by more than 70%. But as you can see here, unfortunately, globally, a high provision of HIV testing and treatment has so far been realized only in 1% of drug users, because we are all very well aware of several other barriers to equity in HIV care for people who inject drugs, such as stigma, discrimination, even criminalization of personal drug use, and last but not least, restrictive clinical practice guidelines, because the study has shown that among 35 European countries, in seven of them, active drug users are prohibited to get treatment. And in one country, this is true also for former drug users. And on top of everything, during the last two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has strongly impeded the delivery of core services particularly, as you can see here, the clinical management, including the treatment, the testing, the diagnosing, uh, as well as the vaccination program. And unfortunately, it mostly decreased activities within the community. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that the WHO viral hepatitis elimination aims are, however, achievable. Besides HBV vaccination, we do have highly effective antiviral treatment of HBV, and particularly for HCV, and they have the potential to drastically reduce morbidity and mortality. However, as we could just see, surveillance data to track progress are poorly collected in much of Europe, which really presents an obstacle to establish the gains. And to realize the WHO goals, collaborative and innovative stakeholder partnerships are definitely needed, including the community, of course, to raise awareness and uh, also to scale up test and treat strategies within the community settings. And of course, increase in um, access to harm reduction services. Because viral hepatitis will not be, uh, elimination will not be achieved uh, without a substantial and sustained investment in harm reduction, in testing, and in treatment. And as you can see here, the elimination package was estimated to be cost-saving in the year 2033. 
But first of all, we are dealing with people here. So reducing stigma and discrimination is a high priority. It definitely cannot be achieved without a combination of interventions targeting uh, stigma in healthcare settings, the structural stigma, as well as self-stigma. And last but not least, to achieve the elimination targets, WHO as well as EASL recommend countries to decriminalize minor nonviolent drug offenses and very importantly, to adopt approach which is based on public health promotion, human rights, and evidence. Let's hope that the updated 2022 to 2030 WHO strategy, uh, which is encouraged by the General WHO Assembly, uh, will join, uh, which will join elimination strategies for HIV, viral hepatitis, as well as sexually transmitted infection in a unified uh, vision using unified health system approaches, will lead us to success. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Maticic. And without further ado, we will just move forward. Uh, it's an honor uh, to invite to speak um, Dr. Bollier from the French Agency for AIDS and Hepatitis Research, ANRS. So he's also the head of hepatology and gastroenterology department and the hospital Saint-Jop from France. Um, it's an honor and he will give us an overview of what is World Hepatitis Elimination Program in France and what is happening there. If you were paying attention to the previous speaker, you could see that the France is always somewhere in green. So the product programs that uh, France is doing and the things that the French people are offering to the French patients seem to work really well. So dear professor, the floor is yours. Bonjour, ça va? Thank you, Marco. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you to HEPA for the invitations. And so I try to share my presentation, but I have some issue to do that currently. I, I can do that, Professor, if okay. it's a problem. I'm just one second. So as you as uh, Moshka mentioned, uh, France is uh, partly uh, in on track to eliminations. And uh, however, if we look at uh, our, um, can I have next slide please? Yes, this is my disclosure, the next slides. So in France, there is in fact currently, uh, can we go back to the previous slides please? In France, uh, there is no uh, national rural hepatitis eliminations program funded by the government per se. However, we have done a lot of things in order to uh, treat and uh, screen and treat for B and EPSI. Next slide please. Uh, so the, the France is working toward HIV elimination through uh, various routes and by the uh, stimulations of the uh, French National uh, program, French Society of Liver Disease and the community, we obtained by uh, July 20, uh, 2017 that we had a universal treatment access to all HIV patients, including patients with acute HIV infections. So that's mean that we move from uh, treatments only uh, proposed to uh, more, the more advanced people or those with extra hepatic manifestations or HIV or HIV convictions to, uh, to, to universal treatments to, for all patients. And moreover, in uh, 2018, um, DEA can be prescribed by any medical doctor in France and dispensing of DEA could be done in any community pharmacies. So that's mean that treatment access is always given to anyone. And the only population that is currently uh, have more difficulties to, to get to treatment is those who are the migrant patients who need to make their uh, access to social rights first and then have access to treatments. Next slide. So with this uh, in mind, uh, there was fantastic progress from uh, 2011 to, through 2016. And it is reflected in this uh, survey showing that the prevalence of infections had decreased of 31%. And the awareness of the people about the infections increased from 57 to 80%. This is a little bit overestimated due to the fact that it is a study done on an interview. And of course, there is more patients that are unaware of the infections. And you can see on the slide that from 2011 to 2016, there was an increase of patients taking insurance, receiving care and antiviral treatments. Next slide. Moreover, interestingly, when we look among blood donors, 
there was a five-fold decrease in, of HIV, less, uh, previous slide, of HIV uh, antibodies positivities between 2001 and 2018. And therefore, the current prevalence of HIV antibodies among blonde, French blood donors is 0.26 per 10,000, which is the lowest prevalence worldwide. And moreover, HIV RNA positivities decreased from 17% to 46%, reflecting the fact that part of those patients have been already treated, and that's a good result about the epidemiology of the disease. Next slide. The, the French Association for Study of Liver Disease have uh, set up uh, some very uh, simple strategy in order to simplify treatments and uh, how to uh, the treatment to be done by anyone uh, and any doctors in the country. And it was based on very simple things, uh, assessments of fibrosis by fibroscan or fibrotest or fibrometers in order to um, characterize patients with advanced fibrosis who need to be followed by hepatologists or infectious disease specialists, and also uh, those with HIV, uh, or HIV or HIV infections, those with poorly controlled more comorbidities, and those who were previously treated. And therefore, next slide, any doctors in France could, be, uh, could treat patients with FC, except for the patients with HIV, HIV infections, uncontrolled morbidity, low platelet, cirrhosis, and uh, low EGFR. Next slide. And we uh, therefore uh, really uh, make a recommendation in 2018 in order, in order to focus on simplicity in HIV management by using pangenetic treatments. And so currently we are using the two pangenetic treatments for either eight to 12 weeks, uh, rather and free in uh, patients with or without compensated cirrhosis. And uh, following this algorithm, it's really hello patients to be really simply treated in the in the community. Next slide. And we also uh, issue some recommendations for the follow-up of these patients. And we next slide, we issue also recommendations for treatments of DA fillers with Sovelvox uh, for 12 to up to uh, 24 weeks as recommended by the EASL and the ASLD uh, recommendations. And we also issue recommendations for the patients on the waiting list. Next slide. With that in mind, uh, if you look at the number of patients that have been already cured, uh, diagnosed and cured by DEAs from 2014 to 2021, we have already cured more than 91,600 uh, patients. However, it remains uh, around 80,000 uh, patients that are, need to be treated. And among them, 30 to more than 50% are in fact unaware of their HIV infections. And as you can see on the lower part of the slides, the number of patients treated by years increased up to 2017. That's mean that and at the beginning of 2018, the number decreased due to the fact that most of the patients were followed into all hepatogastroenterology units or infectious disease unit were already treated. And more than 99% of the co-infected HIV and HIV patients have been already treated. And in 2020 and 2021, you see the consequence of the uh, COVID-19 pandemics with a strict um, diminution of patients treated uh, around 5,000 and 4,005. Uh, next slide, and this is over. Is, is, this is due to various factors, and that during this COVID nineteen pandemic, of course, there was an induced, an increased risk of behavior due to the reduced arm reductions program. There was a difficulty to have a screening and diagnosis and linkage to care due to the fact that uh, a lot of testing facilities were closed and uh, outreach difficulty to program were put on hold. And of course, uh, for the uh, liver disease assessments and treatments, there were some challenge with linkage to care and difficulty to accessing medications and deferral of treatment. So this conduct next slide to the fact that uh, this one year's delay in hepatitis diagnosis and treatments uh, worldwide, or at least in Europe, could result in an additional 44,000 HCC and 72,000 deaths from HIV by 2030. Next slide. So French is in track uh, uh, for HIV eliminations, and but we don't really, uh, the, the French Association for Study of Liver Disease recommend to do uh, universal screening, which is not the recommendations from the HIS, the uh, Autorité de Santé, which is the uh, government and uh, 
um, uh, the, uh, the, which is the uh, decisions from the government. And uh, we have conducted some uh, studies uh, into the general population. And this is the study conducted in Montpellier from September to December uh, 2019. There was a screening campaign in general population with or without prescriptions. Uh, and it was a screening for HIV, HBV, and HIV. And it was preceded by an information campaign in laboratories and public uh, transportation during one month. And you can see that among 10,000 patients who were participants who were screened for HCV, there were only 90 uh, persons who had HCV antibodies positivity and only nine who had HCV RNA positivity. So it's a prevalence of 0.09%. And uh, those nine patients were treated. And if you look at the prevalence of HBV among the general population is even lower, 0.57%, HIV 0.34%, and only syphilis was higher. Interestingly, 83% of the HIV seropositive patients were over 40 years old. And in terms of risk factor, half of the populations responding to the questionnaire and uh, a third of them were contaminated due to medical or surgical procedure before 1992, 33 for miscellaneous risk factors, and 37 persons with no risk factor. So the conclusion of this study is that increased screening, increased screening in people over 40 years of age will be more appropriate than to do a universal screening per se. Next slide. We also uh, conduct study in order to recall HIV patients lost a follow-up in different unit, and this is the uh, I present the result from Bordeaux and Toulouse. And as you can see, when you recall patients, about 50% of them were already cured by uh, outside these centers. And uh, by the end, only 10% of patients achieve SVR after recall. So this is time consuming, but it is quite effective. Next slide. We also conduct study uh, in a test and cure strategy. And there were several mobile hepatitis team units that have been developed in France. This is the result from the most, the oldest mobile hepatitis team. And you can see that uh, with one hepatology, three nurses, one social workers, and two earth care workers, they select uh, patients for one, two weeks prior to test and treat sessions. And the test and treat sessions was very simple. There was a blood test with real-time HIV with CTHED then liver evaluations by harbor scan, social evaluations. And from October 2019 to September 2020, 500 patients were with history of intravenous drug use were screened. 99% uh, were uh, HIV antibodies positive and 33 were HIV RNA positive. And among these 33, 32 were treated. So this is a uh, very efficient actions that can be conducted among the populations who are uh, injecting drugs and who are homeless and outside the uh, setting of hospitals. Next slide. Uh, however, th th there is even more uh, hardest, uh, uh, this is more complicated study uh, reaching the hardest to reach community. That's been the people who are currently injecting drugs. And uh, this, this is a study conducted in Montpellier in which we, uh, set up a community-based respondent driving sampling screening with immediate HIV treatment in active drug users. It's used peer, su peer supports, uh, coupons for network distributions and honoraria for participations. And you can see that it could be very efficient with this system. And uh, among 554 patients who were candidates, the prevalence of HIV antibodies were high, 32%. And there were 49 patients who were eligible for treatments with uh, HIV RNA positivity. And among them, 37 initiated treatments, 30 complete treatments, and uh, 27 achieved SVR. So conducting these, uh, so these, these kind of studies uh, could really uh, be helpful in order to reach the uh, patients who inject drugs who are very difficult to uh, reach. Next slide. However, the, the main problem currently is that uh, all hepatologists and infectious disease uh, specialists have already done the jobs. And the question is whether or not the GP or other specialists are ready to uh, do HIV screening or uh, HIV treatments. And you can see on this survey done on diabetologists and uh, GP from the West and the South part of France, that very few of them are, are really uh, convinced that uh, screening is important in order to lead to treatments. And very few of them, as you can see, uh, uh, thinks that universal screening is, uh, is important. 
And most of them uh, suggest that they will do a screening on risk factor, but you will see that maybe they are not very aware of what is a risk factors. And you can see on this slide that treatments, a very few um, GP or non other specialists are ready to uh, take care uh, of the treatments of HEV. And the same is true for HBV. Next slide. And if we look at the survey that we conduct among specialists in a, in a surgery hospitals in France, uh, and we has the other specialists, non liver specialists, do you screen your patients for HEV? And you see that a quarter of them never test their patients. 14% uh, always test the patients and 33% uh, according to risk factor. But if you ask the physicians, what risk factor do you consider? You see that there is a lack of awareness about what is the risk factor for EPC. Uh, namely, uh, only 23% of the physicians consider that a patient over 50 years old is at risk factors. And 39% uh, consider that unsafe medical practice below 1919 was a risk factor for HIV. And more interestingly, in case of HIV antibodies positivity, only half of them screen for HIV RNA. So therefore, there is a huge uh, need for awareness about uh, HIV transmission screening uh, among non-liver uh, specialists. Next slide. And the same is true for uh, the, the, the oncologist. Uh, a survey conducted in France in 2018 among uh, oncologists look at the various screening before immunotherapies. And you can see that um, 24% of oncologists never test for HCV before immunotherapy. And more interestingly, 21% uh, never test their patients for HBV before immunotherapies. And we know that this is a huge consequence due to HBV reactivations in those patients. So that's where the work needs to be done. Next slide. Next slide. So the key challenge involved in establishing HIV screening and simplified treatment is really linked to the lack of awareness of other medical specialists on HIV disease. The lack of awareness of other medical specialists on HIV treatment modalities. A majority of physicians are still convinced that HIV treatment is still based on interferon ribavirin therapy. And a majority thinks that HIV treatment is associated with numerous side effects and poor quality of life. And all that despite the fact that we give a lot of information about the results of the A treatment. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. We are only speaking between us, but we need to really give the information to the all earth care populations. And we need to overcome that on giving awareness directly to the populations. Next slide. So that's what we try to do that by uh, making awareness campaign among the populations and all care workers. So we conduct a campaign uh, on TV and radio for one week, and we conduct a campaign during the Tour de France. But the impact of those campaign, in fact, are very low due to the fact that they are not repeated. And the best example for that come from Egypt. When they, when they set up the screening program in Egypt, they really uh, launched a large awareness campaign with uh, advertisements on TV and uh, radio for three months. Uh, and that's links, and that was associated with a high rate of uh, the screening among the populations. And we have also uh, issue with the prisons in France. We have 188 prisons in France. How many had zero hepatitis as a target? I think that currently more than half of prisons in France are really doing well the jobs, but we need to involve the other half of the prisons. And the same is true for the 489 drug clinic in France. How many have zero hepatitis as a target? And this is linked to the fact that without any efficient eliminations program, funded by the government, we will not achieve this, this target uh, if we, we want really to involve everyone. Next slide. So what is the priority for HIV elimination in France? We need to enhance screening by algorithms to identify patients at risk for HIV and the same for HBV on the earth case database. That's the huge change of France is that we have a huge first case database and we can use it in order to characterize the patients that could be infected by HCV or HBV um, in, in, in the populations. We need to enhance screening and treatment with the test and strategy in the at-risk populations 
that means active peewids, and I show you the study that we, we conducted, presence, same is true for homeless and migrants. Whole drugs and addictions clinic should enhance test and treat, test and treat, and treat strategy. We need to reinforce risk reduction strategy. Uh, we have a high rate of needle exchange program and a high rate of OST utilizations, but we need to again increase this rate. And we need to conduct awareness campaign amongst earth care worker. And I think general populations, between, we need to overcome the earth care worker and we need to include social media campaign in order to uh, increase the awareness of the populations. And of course, we need to increase to improve management of comorbidities, alcohol overweight and diabetes, and improve follow up of cure patients with advanced fibrosis. And for that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, dear Professor Masiwoku. A very interesting data and very interesting overview. So we went from the overview in Europe, then for especially what is happening in France. And now it's time to see uh, and to give the floor to Professor Zulim to see how we are dealing with or what is happening at the infections for hepatitis B and what is done in the way to try to cure the patients that have uh, HPV infection. Mm -hmm. Professor Zulim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So I, I've shared my, my screen. So that, does it work or not? Uh, yes, we can see it clearly. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, so th thank you, Marco. So, <coughs> So um, uh, today, I mean, the, the, my task was to 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 give you um, uh, an overview of the um, uh, of a, a European uh, Union funded uh, research program on, uh, on hepatitis B to 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 discover new strategies to to cure the, the infection. So this uh, uh, European um, funded program called IPQB for immune profiling to guide those directed interventions to cure HPV infection. Um, and um, I will give you the overall uh, context that you, you all know that uh, uh, WHO is uh, 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 estimate is that we have more than 290 million people worldwide chronically infected by HPV and, and that this infection uh, um, <clears throat> causes at least 800,000 deaths per year. Uh, and as you all know, the currently available treatments, nucleoside analogs such as uh, antecavir tenofovir, uh, as well as interferon, do not eliminate the, the uh, uh, infection. So, so with nucleoside analogs, we can achieve uh, long-term bowel suppression. Um, um, uh, but the, uh, um, the issue is that the uh, um, when we stop treatment, there's only a minority of patients that maintain the uh, 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 um, off-treatment bowel suppression, uh, and only 10% of patients lose HBS antigen, which is called the functional cure, and which allows a treatment cessation uh, after uh, many years of treatment. Um, and we also know that the, the risk of, of developing uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, uh, is, this, is significantly decreased by nucleoside analog treatment, but is not completely eliminated. So clearly we, we need to, to have uh, novel therapies and, the, uh, and there are a lot of research being done currently uh, in, in, that, in that field. So regarding the, uh, this European funded uh, uh, project, the, uh, uh, the overall objectives are to, to develop novel cure strategies with finite duration treatment to improve patient management, prevent HBV-associated liver complication, uh, and treat more patients by reducing the cost associated to, to lifelong therapies. Um, uh, and so here in that project, what we want to do is to, to, to come with a novel immunotherapeutic concept uh, in addition to the uh, classic antivirals uh, to cure chronic uh, HBV infections, thanks to a, a very um, uh, um, um, a, a very detailed and, and uh, outstanding uh, uh, research program. So just to, to, to show you uh, the complexity uh, of the uh, infected liver. So uh, in the infected liver, we have the, uh, the, the liver cells, hepatocytes that, uh, that um, are infected by the virus and, 
uh, here, this is a major component here, the bowel replication. And we have also the immune response. So the host defense against the, against the, uh, the virus, uh, which are usually uh, uh, weak and, and, uh, and exhausted. Um, so the current treatments, um, nucleoside analogs, such as antecavir and tenofovir, they block viral replication in the infected hepatocyte, but they, they do not work very well on, on the uh, host immune responses. So, so when we stop treatment, then uh, the, uh, uh, the infection can re restart and, and relapse from the residual infe infected, uh, infected uh, cells. Uh, here in this uh, European uh, program, we try to, to, to modify the immune responses in the liver uh, so that we can uh, really have uh, control of, of the infection by the, the, uh, by the host defense. Um, and to do so, uh, we are trying to boost uh, the uh, innate immunity, so the first line of defense of, of the body, uh, by a drug called silgantolimod, a TLR8 agonist, uh, so that we can prepare the development of, in the future, of novel therapeutic HBV vaccine. So the, um, here you see the overall consortium of this uh, uh, European project. Uh, so we have uh, teams in, in France, Sweden, Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Greece, Spain, um, as well as uh, uh, in the US, uh, uh, um, a company which is providing, Gilead is providing the drug for the clinical trial, but is not involved in any other part of the research. Um, here you see the overall um, uh, pro program uh, and the structure of the program. So we have, uh, um, um, a proof of concept clinical trial where we try to, to, to modify the immune responses. I will uh, show that in a minute. Uh, and this, in this clinical trial, we collect blood samples and, uh, and also um, uh, liver samples uh, for uh, in-depth uh, analysis uh, of the viral response and the immune response uh, of the patients during, during the trial to, to correlate these to, to uh, 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 to the outcome of treatment, so the, the decrease in HBS antigen and potentially a functional cure. And there's um, uh, also a very important program which is done uh, in preclinical models, so mainly uh, in mouse model uh, of HBV uh, replication, where the uh, objective is to uh, develop um, uh, and identify novel uh, strategies uh, with, with a novel therapeutic vaccine uh, to induce the uh, effective antiviral immune responses uh, before they go to, to, to the clinic. So uh, here we'll show you today the uh, proof of concept clinical trials that I just started this year. Um, so there's, it's a really a, a very well designed classified uh, clinical trial where we have uh, eight uh, clinical uh, sites with, from uh, Ali qualified uh, liver center in, in France, in Paris, Lyon, Marseille, and, and Nancy, as well as in Germany, Italy, uh, and Spain. Um, and there's, uh, uh, as uh, any uh, um, uh, clinical trial following the uh, good clinical practice, so there's a clinical trial unit uh, managing the, tr the trial and the uh, a sponsor of, of the of the trial is ANRS. Um, so the uh, um, IPQB uh, proof of concept clinical study uh, is aims at investigating whether uh, this um, TLR8 agonist, selgantolimod, this uh, um, booster of the uh, first line of defense, uh, uh, will followed by nuke cessation can restore immune responses to control uh, or cure HBV infection um, together with in-depth analysis of the virologic and immunological responses. So the, the clinical trial is a, is a phase two clinical trial, randomized, multi-center, and open uh, label exploratory study uh, where patients um, um, are treated by nucleoside analogs. They are E-antigen negative with chronic hepatitis B. 
uh, with valve suppression for at least three years following the ESL criteria. Uh, and the randomization is one to two, two. Uh, uh, so uh, 20 patients in arm A will continue nucleoside analog as before. Uh, 40 patients in arm B will stop uh, nucleoside analog after a 20, 28 weeks of treatment uh, of, um, uh, in, in the study. And uh, in arm C, 40 patients will receive, uh, in addition to their nuke, uh, cell gantolimod, so the uh, booster of the innate immunity, before stopping all treatment. Uh, so we have 100 patients total. Um, uh, and the uh, sample size has been uh, made, uh, calculated based on a primary endpoint, which is a decline uh, in HBS antigen uh, in serum. So the, the, just to show you the main inclusion criteria is uh, uh, patients meeting the ESL criteria, so HB antigen negative chronic hepatitis B, uh, non-serotic, uh, with no evidence of advanced fibrosis, virally suppressed on nukes for at least three years um, with viral load below uh, 20 uh, units and, and normal transaminase, uh, um, providing a, a favorable uh, safety profile for addition of immune modulators, um, and serum HBS antigen levels um, below 3,000 and higher than 100. Uh, as we know from uh, previous studies that this virologic profile is more prone to effective immune intervention and to respond to new cessation. So this, this is a, 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 an important uh, patient population because we have so many patients on nuke who are willing to stop treatment. So this uh, trial is also offering the opportunity to, uh, to stop treatment at, at some stage within a, a, a clinical study. Uh, so the trial timeline, so we have started the uh, a trial uh, at the, uh, during the, the spring. So far, we have six patients uh, enrolled. Um, uh, so new sites are, have been uh, uh, initiated now uh, uh, in, in Italy, uh, and the uh, next one will be Barcelona uh, and, and Freiburg. Um, and the study duration uh, will be so. Uh, 18 months, so the uh, end of the uh, overall study is uh, expected to be at the end of 2024, so in uh, uh, one year and a half from now, uh, two, two years and a half from now, from now sorry. Uh, so uh, just to, uh, to conclude, I think uh, this study is really just part of all the development program that is done uh, worldwide with different type of uh, replication inhibitors, and I don't go through, through all of them, um, strategies to reduce viral antigen uh, expression and strategies to, to boost the uh, uh, immune responses, either by invigorating the immune responses or by st stimulating the, uh, specifically these, these responses, especially with therapeutic vaccines. So, so we are at a stage where we need to, to know really more about all uh, these different uh, 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 mode of action, mechanism of action, so that we can have the, um, all the scientific um, information to make the best choice to combine these different drugs to increase uh, the, the rate and the possibility of, of functional cure uh, for, for patients. And with this, I will stop here and Massimo will go on with the uh, um, uh, more uh, translational and basic research in this program. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I just wanted to have a side note in regards to the presentation. So during the development of everything, patients were included into the process. And I just wanted to highlight this as a president of ALPA, uh, that this was a very interesting work where uh, also the patient groups were included, the end of line consumers were included into the discussions, which has brought the scientists into the field of uh, how to present this, what will be the benefits for the patient communities and the patients. And this was really interesting discussion. And we are trying our best to promote this research also 
uh, outside to other patient communities that are not involved. But of course, uh, building up strong relationships also with SOS Hepatite, which is a member of ALPA. But without further ado, I would now give the floor. So, buongiorno, Professor Levera. <laughs> I, he is a university professor and a specialist at the uh, University Hospital Claude Bernard Lyon 1 at the, the uh, Department of Hepatology and Gastroenterology. It is really a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours, Professor Levero. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, grazie. Um, I will uh, um, try to share the screen. Let's see if I succeed. Do you see it? Yes, we see the okay. presentation. Perfect. So uh, my task, uh, as anticipated by Fabian Zulim, uh, the previous speaker, is to go a little bit into detail about the translational research and the basic research that is performed within the IPQRB uh, EC funded uh, project. So from the scientific point of view, the objectives of the project were to implement uh, a new uh, program, uh, cutting edge program to develop a novel immunotherapeutic concepts to cure chronic hepatitis B infection. And also to learn from an innovative clinical trial, the one that uh, Fabian Zulim just uh, described to you, to identify biological and immunological biomarkers predicting HBV cure. <clears throat> what are the big challenges to get HBV cure? You have if you want to simplify, two challenges. Uh, One there, is... Professor, we yes. just see the first, first slide. We don't go to the next slide. You, uh, this is bad. I don't know what to do. Do you want to... Uh, we can start it again. Do you want to upload? And I do like... Uh, yeah. now, now we see the scientific objectives in the... Okay, but it's not full screen. Do you see? So... We see the presentation now, but not in the, the presentation mode. Yeah. So if you go there, we can see the other slides also now. Yeah. I try again to go a full screen. Tell me if you see the next one. Probably not. No. Go back. So if you do not go to the full screen, but you... I just stay like this probably. This you see enough? Yeah. Of it? Okay. Yes. I, I just stay like this so I can change the, the slide myself. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. So the, what are the big challenges to get HBV cure? And the, by the way, also hepatitis delta cure. There are mainly simplifying things, two challenges. One is the defective immune response to hepatitis B in chronic uh, uh, patients. There is an exhaustion of immune responses that promotes the chronization and the prolonged uh, liver damage. The, in this sense, re-educating the, the liver, the liver microenvironment, and training the immune system to clear HBV with vaccine and cytokine drugs will be very hard. So novel things are needed. The second big challenge is the fact that the major um, uh, replicative intermediate of uh, hepatitis B virus, let's say the mastermind of uh, hepatitis B virus replication that is called the CCC DNA stays in the nucleus and is really difficult to, uh, to target. It, it is there in different, different status and it is able to evade most of the interventions that we have developed to eat the virus. So we need, uh, you have to move differently. Okay, so we need more knowledge on the virus and the host responses to the viruses. We need the new diagnostic assays. We need the new therapeutic strategies. And the IPB Cure uh, project is about that. Uh, as already presented by Fabian, uh, there is a clinical trial and there are different work packages, uh, activities around the research. I will present both the more translational re uh, research uh, um, programs that are mainly devoted to a complete characterization of what is going on in the patients that are enrolled in, in, in the clinical trial, and also some more basic fundamental research that uh, is carried on to develop the next generation interventions. These are uh, the this is the, 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 the these are the participants to the to the to the project and I just highlighted in red the different uh, centers uh, that are involved in translational and uh, basic research. 
The first point is uh, to use somehow the uh, clinical study to generate uh, new knowledge about uh, the interaction between the, <clears throat> the virus and the host and how treatments can, can modulate the liver microenvironment. And to do that, different kinds of samples are obtained to, uh, throughout the, 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 the clinical study, liver samples, blood samples that will sustain the research of the so-called viral monitoring platform that will look for virological correlates of HBD cure and the immune profiling platform that will look for immunological correlates of HBD cure. But we have to know that to do good translational science, we need extra good logistics. So one first task that the scientists and the clinicians involved in, in, the, in the project had to uh, cope with was to develop a, a, a detailed uh, uh, logistics schematic to, to uh, ensure that the samples are correctly, that no one single sample is wasted and that the samples are properly collected uh, shipped and um, to the appropriate uh, research center and uh, stored over time. Let's now focus on the Bioman monitoring platform on the study of the virological correlates of the HBD cure. Uh, there are two main activities. One, to look for circulating viral biomarkers. That is obviously what we look for and what we want to, uh, to have at the end, something easy to use. And uh, the second activity is about intrahepatic variable markers. It's important to do that to uh, validate the, the, the clinical meaning and uh, the usefulness of the circulating variable markers. Regarding the circulating variable markers, you have here a list of usual biomarkers, I would say, the, the ones that are already well established, some investigational biomarkers that are more and more uh, coming into use in uh, uh, clinical research, uh, the so-called correlated antigen and the circulating HBD RNAs in particular that we focused on. And we also will study some more exploratory biomarkers, but I have no time to go into all these details. Regarding the intrahepatic biomarkers, we will use a, a plenty of methodologies to uh, study viral parameters, to quantify the CCC DNA, the uh, viral DNA, and uh, the um, viral transcripts in the liver, and to study deeply the, uh, the functioning of the uh, CCC DNA, in particular what is called the epigenetic regulation, because this mini chromosome from the virus is regulated exactly like the host uh, genome and the host chromosomes. There is a second activity of the view before that is uh, relating to the study of the same bi viral biomarkers in the blood of patients from chronic hepatitis B established cohorts. Uh, we have one prospective cohort that has been established in Milan and Lyon uh, and, and other centers uh, as well, and some retrospective uh, cohorts that are provided by the, all the partners in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the project. We also have we also have uh, a very interesting uh, cohort coming from a, a collaboration with the Swiss Eurocida uh, cohort, and making use of a, a new test for circulating um, uh, HBDRNA that we have co-developed uh, with uh, Roche Diagnostics we could study the, uh, the, the, the usefulness of circulating, B, uh, circulating BRNAs and correlated antigen in a, a, a large cohort of 1,500 patients with, in different phases of the disease. And we have seen the simple message is that there is a, a clearly a potential for complementary clinical information. So depending on the drug that probably will be used and depending on the face of the disease, we may need to go uh, for two biomarkers and not one. The second study that I just want to highlight is a study in which the, the circulating HBV RNA was uh, um, tested and uh, was uh, um, studied uh, together with intrahepatic uh, biomarkers and the study allowed to establish that the circulating HBV RNA are a good biomarkers of the activity of this mastermind of the viral replication that is in the in the, in the, in the, uh, endowed in the nuclei of, of infected hepatocytes, the CCC DNA. 
Regarding the intrahepatic variable markets, one activity that was uh, uh, set up in the consortium was to um, implement in all the clinical study the use of a micro-invasive uh, procedure, the fine needle um, aspirate biopsy, that is slightly different from the, the usual biopsy that is a slightly more invasive. In this case, you have just an aspiration of uh, liver tissue, and you get hepatocytes and mononuclear cells that can be studied for the immune uh, components, but also, as shown in a nice uh, study uh, performed in Lyon uh, and uh, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the center in the UK, that FNA and core biopsy are equally performing uh, in, uh, in uh, giving us a proper quantification of CCCDNA and viral transcripts. So this is very important because this is the base to use and validates the use of fine needle um, aspirates uh, for, the, for the clinical studies. And we have implemented standard operating procedure throughout the, the, uh, the, uh, the consortium. All this that I presented you is mainly uh, has been done uh, all along the COVID crisis and the exit from the COVID crisis while waiting for the samples that have to come from the study, because as you have seen, the, the clinical study has just started. So the samples will come to the study later on, and we will continue to work on the biomarkers uh, on hepatitis B uh, chronically infected patients beyond the, uh, the, um, the clinical study. The WIP, uh, uh, War Package 5, the new profiling platform, uh, um, as well, is waiting for samples from the clinical study. In the meantime, the centers that are involved in this work package have, have done a very nice work in the, standardiz uh, in the standardization of immunomonitoring assay. Immune assays have been used for a long time to try to understand and to try to classify patients with very little uh, success. No real biomarkers have been developed. And this is because mainly because the, the assays were not standardized. So in the, in the consortium, there has been a big effort to uh, set up standardized methodology to study the innate immunity, the signaling uh, pathways and the molecules that are important for innate immunity to uh, establish very strict procedures for the uh, phenotypical, transcriptional, metabolic, and functional um, characterization of all the HBV-specific T and B cells that are important for the hepatitis B uh, control and that are the target of the immuno uh, interventions that are uh, developed in the EPBQR. There is also a good activity that has been has been uh, has been performed to uh, have uh, to investigate the the intrahepatic immune responses and to set up a procedure for flow cytometry and for immunohistochemistry to uh, get at the same time multiple parameters studied from the intrahepatic. I just want to uh, continue very very fast for a few seconds on the more. Uh, more basic research activity of the of the of the of the project. All that I told you uh, uh, is related to uh, to the patients. Here are preclinical. Uh, the work package three deals for with preclinical research, essentially to develop innovative HBV therapeutic vaccines to perform and test this vaccine to perform preclinical studies in humanized mice. I will tell you what are these uh, uh, special mice and to do some mechanistic studies in uh, hepatocyte culture. The first uh, block of work is to design and down select the best in class HBV innovative therapeutic vaccine using special uh, technologies, in particular a technology that is called the DC targeting vaccine is a platform that has been already used for other viral diseases and uh, infectious diseases and as the, the characteristic to try to uh, bring the, the, the relevant antigens for immunostimulation directly to the, 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 the DC cells, the dendritic cells, that are so important to mount a new uh, immune response. Uh, the work uh, can be divided into steps. First, there is an identification by computer-assisted analysis of the best uh, 
portions of the viral proteins that are immunogenic and to be that have to be tested in, in the new vaccine, uh, followed by the production of a recombinant antibodies that will bring this information to the to the dendritic uh, cells that uh, have to act as uh, as uh, starters for the for the immune response uh, and to produce clinically validated vaccine lots. This has been done already during the COVID crisis. Despite the COVID crisis, the consortium have progressed a lot on that. And now there is the phase of testing these uh, vaccine candidates in uh, uh, for their capacity to induce immune response, a relevant immune response in the mouse models, as well uh, some preliminary study in humans in vitro, ex vivo, on uh, cells coming from uh, chronic hepatitis B uh, patients. I told you that uh, there will be uh, this uh, candidate vaccine that will be tested in uh, special mice, uh, and these special mice are uh, mice in which the 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 liver is humanized, so it's a mouse, but the liver is partially human, and the immune system is uh, completely reconstituted with uh, with uh, an human uh, immune system. This allow to study hepatitis B, uh, because we, you have to know that hepatitis B does not infect any other animal uh, beyond the humans and uh, primates, big, uh, big primates. And using these uh, different uh, uh, mice, the mice with a humanized immune system, a mice with a humanized liver, but more particularly, a very cutting edge technology to obtain humanized immune system and liver uh, mice, uh, using these uh, different mice, the, um, the, the scientist in the EPBQ uh, project will be able to uh, study the, the ability of the different vaccines and the, the innate immune stimulation, the same one that we use in the, in the patients in the clinical trial, to de detect the immune stimulation, to study the immune stimulation, and to uh, make combinations that we could not do yet in the clinical, in the clinical setting. I will not go into details on, about the mechanistic studies, the third part of the World Package 3, that deals with a number of studies to, to characterize the fine mechanism that uh, the drug that is involved, that uh, we use in the, in the, in the, in the clinical study uh, work, how it works to uh, induce the control of hepatitis B uh, replication and several technologies, viral outcomes, immune uh, uh, immune uh, profiling are applied to this specific uh, specific uh, um, uh, part of the work. So to conclude, this is my last slide. The IPB cure uh, ambition from the scientific point of view is to bring together scientists, doctors, and patients all allied to develop a novel therapeutic vaccines to cure chronic hepatitis B uh, infection, to identify biological, immunological biomarkers predicting HBB cure. And they want to underline that uh, uh, this uh, uh, work on the, uh, this more translational work on the biological, immunological biomarkers will not only be instrumental to, to qualify the new vaccines that are being uh, uh, studied and, and developed in the, in the consortium, but will be very, very useful to assist the development of the, any other therapeutic strategy with all the components that uh, Fabian Zulim uh, presented before. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, dear professor. Grazie mille for the excellent presentation. Uh, very busy slides, but we all appreciate that the explanation was very down to earth and very easy to understand. So thank you very much. In regards to our program, we are slowly going to the end of the program. Um, the idea was to collect some of the questions from our members because we were promoting this event among our members for the last uh, 30 days. We received more than 10 different questions and prior to the event, we selected at least two or three of them from our members. And I propose that this next part would be that I just read out the question and, and then maybe we go through the professors that are most suitable or the want to answer the question. And uh, the first one that I got here was from uh, our member in Spain. And uh, it's, it goes like that, from the liver patient perspective, we are observing the process of hepatitis elimination with very much concern. Few countries seem to be on track on to achieve the goal 
and which are the gaps and how can we work together? I would just rephrase that because we saw a lot of things that could be done, but what do you think could be a very smart first step? So uh, if I'm opening up the floor, so yes, please. I think that one of the first steps that we need to achieve is to promote and to be uh, and to let all the patients be accessible to free treatments. And so that's the key point. And that's what we achieve in France in uh, by allowing every AB and FC patients to be treated, whatever his fibrosis stage is and whatever is his conditions. And I think that's what we need to do is to fight against all the uh, stigma that then does not allow uh, special populations to have access to treatment. And I think this is key because if we access, if we have that, we would be able to uh, at least achieve eliminations, but at least to propose eliminations to everyone. And that's our, I think our task as a, as a community to do so. And then I think uh, by doing that, as, you, as I've shown you, it's not enough because uh, it's only involving her community. And I think that's why we need to develop awareness about the disease and about the treatment facilities that we have now. And I think that we have to increase the knowledge of the general population on this in order to achieve eliminations. Otherwise, we will not achieve it. Thank you very much, Professor Borlier. Professor Maticic. Yes, if I may, uh, I, I completely agree with that, of course, and I just like to add uh, to uh, your data, Mark, that you showed about the medical professionals not being aware of the fact. So I think that first, the microelimination should be performed in those patients that do have medical records that we know them. We do have the lists of them. So just take them out, just test them and treat them immediately. And in that way, I think much can be done and of course then go out to the of course at the same time to the community to the risk factors groups and so on thank you thank you very much professor zulin you wanted to comment no no i i fully ah, okay, agree okay. With, with with what has been said and i think what, what one of the um, uh, current issue is that the uh, all the um, um politicians uh, and governments are, are now more focused on, on, on the COVID crisis than on the other uh, 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 medical issues um, that are actually killing more, more, patient, more people than, than COVID now. Um, so it's, uh, it's going, we, we need to raise awareness at every stage of the society, uh, uh, um, going from the general population to, to the, stakeholders, politicians, uh, govern, government bodies, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, because we, here's the, uh, unfortunately, since two years, we, we have to face this uh, situation where the, the uh, interest, let's say interest has shift, shifted to, to, uh, uh, to, to COVID. Um, and now it's the monkeypox and, and, and so on. Uh, so, so we, yeah, okay, we, we have to deal with this. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, give up the fight, as someone was, was saying. <laughs> if, uh, if I can word it in a more cinematographic way, no disease, no patient should be left behind. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Boulier, you are on mute. We cannot hear you. Uh, I think that ELPA uh, needs to really help the community and to, to make pressure on the governments in order to uh, really uh, improve the, the screening and the detections. And I, if you look at the COVID-19 crisis, during this crisis in Europe, several countries attempt to try to combine uh, COVID-19 screening with hepatic, hepatitis screening. Except, except in, uh, in Italy, in which there was uh, some uh, study that have been done uh, to combine COVID-19 and HIV uh, uh, screening. Uh, otherwise, all the other governments refuse to, uh, to do so. And so that's where uh, the um, patients community uh, need really to be uh, on the front line in order to uh, 
push the government in order to uh, facilitate uh, such detections because we have we have seen with COVID-19 that we are able to do a large number of things in European country but uh, for uh, EDB and EPSI it was a disaster because uh, the, the screening uh, really decreased during the meantime during the same period so that's where we need to push and that's a, a, a political advocacy that we need to make Thank you very much. I need to add our patient view. And of course, as you know, uh, just patients in the door front of decision makers is not enough. We need good data and we need a very close collaboration with the practitioners because we are maybe uh, able to open the door, but we need solid ground for the patient activities and patient, uh, all the advocacy work. And I see this as a great example of what we are doing with Professor Zolim and Professor Levero in regards of this IPQB project where we try to raise the awareness. And I, I completely agree. It's, we are at the beginning with the COVID crisis, we took a, like two steps back, but maybe it's also a positive thing because now when I go through the streets, everybody is asking me, about healthcare, about vaccination, about so the general public is much more interested in the healthcare issues than it was before. And we will try to leverage that to try to focus, keep the focus on the health issues even when the COVID crisis will not be there. Uh, sorry to add this uh, from my side, but I would like to just to have at least one more question that we received. Um, I will give the floor to Milan. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, thank you very much to all professors. Uh, this was amazing presentations. Uh, you give me a little bit more hope for the future, I must be honest. After this COVID-19 situation, I'm so grateful. Um, I have a question from our member from uh, Portugal. Uh, the pandemic brought about the massive disruption uh, in the healthcare systems, even within the EU. We know some have been more uh, re resilient than others to the uh, determinated of the testing, screening, and vaccination in the in field of hepatitis. How can we maintain essential vi uh, viral hepatitis and uh, liver disease services, and even upscale them uh, they are decision for the elimination of the process? I hope so that I, I, I... hello. I think that the, the, one of the good arguments uh, to, to use is the fact that, for example, for, for, example, for EPSI, we have a, a possibility to cure more than 99.8% of the patients with the current available treatments. And there is no other disease in which we can achieve such goal. So I think that we need to use uh, this as an argument when we discuss with the, with the community and with the political uh, about uh, the, the needs for for increase the the the, the screening process uh, and the initiation of treatment. Uh, I think that what uh, really Fabien presented as Massimo is really a hope for HEDB because we really uh, are in hope to obtain a, a fine durations of treatments for HEDB, and uh, we have, we are at the beginning of the process, but the, the process is is still going on. And uh, I think that we, within the next 10 years, we will be able maybe to have some uh, results in order to achieve this goal. And this is very important for EDB because uh, currently among the 50 million people that should, uh, have, should receive treatment, there is only 5 million of them who receive treatments worldwide. And so uh, if we want to fulfill the gap, uh, which is the uh, WHO uh, objective for 2030, uh, we need to really to, to, to work on this. And so, uh, well, uh, I think the, the EPSI result treatment is really something that we should use as, um, as an argument for, for, for improving the, the, the screening uh, and the detections uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the treatment of the patients. Thank you very much, Professor Maticic. Yes, if I may just add, because the question was referring to the COVID-19 pandemic and its uh, influence to decrease all the 
um, already gained things uh, towards the elimination of viral hepatitis. I think there have been some collateral benefits of COVID pandemic, for example, like telemedicine, like decentralization of, of cure or of management of patients. So I think we should just increase those activities, not to lose them now when the pandemic is uh, a little bit uh, lighter. Uh, so I think we should take the advantage of the good things and and we should just potentiate them uh, also within the community because as I showed you on the slide, the community activities towards elimination were mostly affected during the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Fabian, Thank you. Professor Levero. Uh, yeah. I, I don't want to step on Fabian, but I, I would like just to, to, I completely agree with what was said about the, 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 the new uh, tools of medicine that we were obliged to use uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and I think that we have to make, uh, to make advantage of what we learned, that what we can manage in that way, what we cannot manage in that way. But uh, I just want to come back to what Mark uh, Bollier was saying. Uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C are not at the same stage of development. But I'm old enough to remember when I started uh, curing hepatitis C patients, we were curing five to 10% of the patients. And after we were, were going stepwise up. So the message for hepatitis C is everybody can be cured. Give the drug that we have to everybody. For hepatitis B, I think that we have to be a little bit more subtle. Hepatitis C was a mighty enemy, but was a simple-minded enemy. The hepatitis B is a very smart and vicious enemy that is able to play the things on different levels. So the way to cure and finally win will be difficult. We are in good track, but will not be for today or tomorrow. So what we have to say now very clearly is that we have to give access to the present strategies of cure that already get a lot of benefit for the patients to all the patients with hepatitis B that need it. And we have to sustain at the same time research, alliance of patients, doctors, and scientists to boost the research for hepatitis B cure, because over time we will go up probably not in one step at 99.9, .9, because it's, it's never like that in life, but we will go up and we have to continue to do that. And we have all to be together in this and also the institutions and the stakeholders have to follow on that. Thank you very much. We go first for Professor Zulim and then to Moita. Yeah. Okay, now just, just um, uh, no, I agree with um, uh, what Massimo has said, I mean, we. We, we, we need to really increase the number of patients that are treated with, with the currently available drugs. So um, uh, screening, linkage to care uh, for hepatitis B is extremely important uh, and make sure that we um, secure sufficient uh, uh, budget for research at, at the level of countries or, or international level uh, so that HBV research continues, so that we can improve the current the current uh, strategies. Uh, uh, another thing that we uh, we didn't mention because they, they, today the meeting is has to be focused is that we we shouldn't forget hepatitis delta as well. Uh, I mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, we 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 really need to because there's a, a, a major uh, uh, unmet need there and uh, and and this patients with hepatitis delta are, are most often uh, um, uh, from uh, vulnerable populations, uh, so we, which is increasing the uh, difficulty for, for linkage to care and, uh, and so on. But now that um, EMA has granted uh, conditional approval for bilivertide, I think we, we need to push for, for that so that patients that were non-responders to interferon advanced fibrosis uh, should be diagnosed and should be treated. Yeah, and Moshka, please, please. Yeah, sorry, let me just go a step back to hepatitis B and having outstanding researchers and clinicians here for hepatitis B treatment. I'd just like to give you a question, very simple one. We know that not all HBS antigen positive persons are eligible for treatment. 
Are you in favor of expanding the indications for treatment so far available or not? <laughs> Who takes this? <laughs> well, I think I think that what we have to keep in mind is, according to the guidelines, uh, there is about 50 million people with EDB who should be who should have been treated, and currently there is about five million. So that means there is only 10 percent of the people who need to be treated currently by uh, with EDB uh, with a uh, nucleoside analog are, are treated. So the first thing, as Massimo said is we need to treat all these 50 million people. And then after we can extend the indications of treatment. And of course, in the future, as we progress into the, our knowledge, we will increase the number of patients treated. But currently, if we first achieve the goal of treating those 50 million people who need to be treated, will be the first objective. Massimo? If I may. I completely agree with you. So this is why I, 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 I use the, 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 the terminology all the hepatitis B patients in need of treatment because there is obviously some discussion among the experts on which of the categories. If we stay with the current guidelines, we treat a number of patients. We may want some of us to extend slightly already the indication to very precise category of patients. But we have to remember that we can do that in a precise way according to the guidelines in the rich countries and the middle income countries eventually but we cannot easily do that because of the lack of diagnostic tools and the heaviness of the diagnostic tools in terms of burden and cost in the, the in the in the low income countries where most of the patients are or many of the patients are if we uh, consider that china is out of the of this uh, consideration uh, because they are rich enough to, to do what they want uh, finally uh, so this is the major point the, the, the what was asked by by uh, uh, was 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 do you are you uh, in favor of extending largely the, the i think that in specific situations and there are advocate for that very 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 uh, good scientists and clinical scientists that are, are advocating that, epidemiologists that are advocating that, uh, that in some situation, test and treat might be applied with the nukes, with the old uh, therapies, even uh, without going into a precise characterization of the different category of patients as we do uh, usually in our, in our clinical practice. It's a big issue, so uh, I don't want... If we talk of European perspective, because here we are, let's say, a little bit European perspective, I, I, I would agree 100% with what Mark said. We can slightly perform differently, but not so much nowadays. And we have to need, we have to have more knowledge. But we have to know that in other situations, from a more WHO perspective, let's say, we might be uh, uh, led to a different way to, to do things. And after there will be a problem of uh, equality. Why I'm European, I don't get it, and uh, somebody else get it just because it's elsewhere. It's a big issue. Again, I think that the, what's the, the progress of the science? Sure, uh, country we can use to such new such as HB related antigens as a surrogate marker for HBV DNA. And that should be implemented in this uh, low-income country Absolutely. in order to, to make them to have access to treatments. And I think that's, again, the progress that the, the, the tools that we have currently for uh, diagnosing the patients, for diagnosing the patients. <coughs> We are going a little bit technical, I would say, but uh, it's important what we were <laughs> saying. So I, I think we are going out of the scope of this uh, presentation. Uh, so European Liver Patient Association is focused on Europe or WHO uh, definition of Europe. And we have a lot of things to do in Europe, but it's nice to see what all the small things that we can combine or learn and, and transfer between countries uh, even in Europe or elsewhere, just to have the benefits for liver patients. So with that, I would then close this discussion and I will go to the last part.
uh, and the last part is just uh, far away. It's a, just uh, a word of goodbye from myself as a president of ALPA. And then the last word should go to Professor Zulim. But from my side, I would just say, Professor Bourlier and Professor Zulim, merci beaucoup uh, for today. Uh, dear Professor Matijic, najlepše hvala za vaš prispevek danes. And uh, Professor Levero, uh, grazie mille. And now I will give the floor to Professor Zalim to close the meeting. Okay. Merci will speak in French. <laughs> yeah, Marco knows. Yeah. Marco knows very really well, but I'm Italian. It is very kind of Marco to. Moi aussi, je parle Super. So we on aurait dû faire le meeting en français. Alors finalement, le. le okay. No way. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Marco, and thank you, um, all, all of you. I mean, we, uh, I think we had a very nice discussion today, um, very uh, lively, informative. I hope it was helpful for for patients, for Elpa, um, uh, and I mean, together, I mean, all, all the clinicians and researchers, we uh, we will work with, with you um, to to support all, all the actions that we have to do. Um, to fight liver disease in uh, at least in in our countries and in Europe, and if we can do uh, also uh, uh, globally, we we will help as well. But we, as we discuss um, issues, maybe maybe specific to 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 each part of the world. So, but um, I think we uh, for hepatitis C, we are, we have all the tools to to go for a. Uh, for the WHO uh, uh, objectives, we, we need to continue the, uh, the different strategies of test and uh, uh, test and treat uh, for hepatitis B and Delta. It's a, it's a, will be a, a longer way, uh, but the uh, the research is very dynamic, and there are so many drugs now that are on in phase two clinical trials, and and some will enter phase three trials so uh, next year. So I think we we are really in a in a good way. So there's there's a really hope uh, for for the future, and we we need to uh, to to have all communities, the uh, researchers, clinicians, patients, uh, maintain their engagement so that we can we can see the uh, uh, clinical development of these drugs and 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 see their success, which is what we want to to have. And thank you all, and thank you for 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 this meeting. Thank you.